Today's webinar will focus on the Local Environmental Observers Network. The webinar is being recorded and we will post the presentation and webinar recording on ITEP's Climate Change Webinars webpage. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. The presenter will answer the questions following the presentation. And following the presentation, you'll receive a link to a short online evaluation form. Uh, please take a few minutes to, pro to provide feedback and suggestions of topics for future webinars. Here is my contact information. ITEP's Climate Change Program offers climate change trainings, webinars, a tribal climate change newsletter, and the Tribes and Climate Change website, and much more. I encourage you to visit our uh, climate change program website at the URL listed on the slide and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about ITEP. I am very pleased to have Mike Brubaker with us for this webinar. Mike specializes in assessing health conditions in rural communities. In particular, he focuses on environment, pollution, development, and climate change. Mike was born in Juneau, Alaska and raised in Anchorage. He earned his BS in biology from St. Lawrence University and an MS in environmental management from the University of San Francisco. He was a Peace Corps environmental volunteer in Hungary from 1995 to 1997 and has worked in the Alaska tribal health system for 17 years. He was the co-founder of the Center for Climate and Health at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and is the founder of the Local Environmental Observer, or LEO, network. He has been the lead author on over 20 assessments about the impacts of climate change in rural Alaska communities, and he publishes the weekly e-journal, The Northern Climate Observer. With that, let's turn Mike over to the presenter. And Mike, uh, you can take it from here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both some of the climate change challenges here in Alaska um, and about the uh, LEO network, the LEO network, um, how it works and how it got started. And then I'm going to talk also and show you a few examples of some of the observations that people have posted um, throughout the year. So let's go ahead and just get right into it. And, and as a background, I work for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. It's the statewide tribal health system for Alaska. And we receive our funding for this program from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. But the tribal health system is, you know, recognizes the importance um, in in Alaska and the Alaska Native community for you know having healthy environment and healthy resources in order to have healthy people. So a healthy environment in Alaska and healthy people are and, and having access to healthy resources is important for all of that. So it's what we call a one health approach and it's a term that's being used more and more frequently um, in the public health communities is this recognition of the connections and so we have to pay attention to all of these things. So here's a few introductory questions about LEO Network that you might have. Um, it started in 2012. The purpose was to provide a system for communities to share information about environmental change and to connect with the resources needed to address impacts and that means people in other communities who have knowledge about climate change impacts, or environmental impacts, as well as uh, academic institutions or agencies, um, and or organizations that that you know provide resources. And who is involved? Um, local environmental managers here in Alaska, usually in tribal governments, as well as a wide range of agencies and organizations that provide technical support. And the mission is really to provide the e eyes, ears, and voice. Um, to uh, record and uh, respond to environmental change. So here's a couple of the observations that were posted. We're just going to kind of do a run through the calendar um, from last year, starting with January 24th. 
and we review these observations in a monthly webinar and um, and have an opportunity to hear firsthand quite often from the people who, who shared these. So on January 24th, um, Nancy Eaton from Nenwalik wrote, there, there's no snow. The mountain right behind the village provides water in the summertime. The lack of snow has made as many people concerned. And this is, continues to be an ongoing problem. Um, right now, I'm near Nenwalik, where I'm, where I'm at right now, and um, the lack of snow on the mountains, which we depend on as far as snowpack for our community water supply, has got us concerned about possible rationing later. Um, Bruce Wright um, observed on February 12th, the first first seal of the year, a male came ashore on St. George, one of the Pripyloff Islands located in the Bering Sea. They usually return in May. Then on March 14th, this, you know, just is just an amazing image for Alaska where you have um, this guy on his uh, dock sled. He's actually, um, this is during the, the time of the Iditarod race, and there's just absolutely no snow, and that's what Toby and Nungazuk Jr. and Gullivan saying. The absence of snow did not allow caribou harvest by two hunting parties, otherwise families would have been out hunting more often. And the same thing happened this winter in Alaska, very little snow. Um, ben Balavet and Bethel on April 13th, very little snow this year in Bethel, area making traveling in the springtime on the Kuskokwim River very dangerous and difficult. Travelers need to look out for open water and thin ice. So, I mean, this is a, a nice um, connection that Ben's made between, you know, the environmental conditions and potential health risk as far as injury and falls through ice. Then on May 16th, this is kind of one of the good news observations. The herring has arrived early this year. Last night some of the hunters noticed some were starting to spawn near Cape Denby. Herring season was scheduled for May 25th, 2014, but due to the early arrival, I'm not sure what will happen. And that's by Jolene Allier and Shaq Tulik. Then on June 6th, another kind of good observation, but unusual, you know. This is from Anne John, Anna John in Tuxic Bay. She said, an abundance of kelp on one side of the island is making, is the most I've ever seen during the low tide. There's also a large deposit of herring eggs covering the kelp, which was harvested. And you can see that's what's in the foreground there. Those are the herring eggs. Debbie Nicktoon on July 15th reported, Tuesday there was unusual high water on the Koyukuk River. We lost five feet of bank or more at one site. The bank below my mother's house is cracking back to the driveway of the old house. And she sent some other photos later showing, you know, the, the, le the amount of erosion that was happening. You get a little sense of that in the lower right-hand corner. And this was a this was a quite a important event that we had from 2014, and that's when the you know the w conditions were warm, the river was warm. Um, and I'm going to try to get this full view, but um, and and there was a record run of chum salmon going up the Kobuk River. And we think maybe so much salmon was running up the river that uh, it resulted in maybe some oxygen deficiency um, and maybe some algal blooms, which might have contributed. But at the same time as there was, you know, millions of salmon going up the, the Kobuk, there was also many, many fish who had not yet spawned that were dying along the side of it. And you can see some of this kind of brown algal uh, material on the, on the side of the photo. And so that's what Virginia Comac says from Ambler. Have you heard about the dead salmon? Thousands on the beaches of the Kobuk River. We have been concerned about some brown foamy stuff in the bottom of the river, which is not usually there. And so she's, this is a great image, and she kind of captures it all there and at one time. So 
September. This is from Sylvia Kazimirowicz in Ekwok. This last year was a very unusual berry year. I mean, there was uh, virtually no berries harvested in the Bristol Bay region, and other regions were having poor harvest as well. And that's something we've noticed is just a lot more variability in the um, production of berries and, of course, in the harvest success as well. So people are adapting and changing the way they they harvest their berries because of that and the places where they, they harvest their berries. So Sylvia says, this has been a terrible year for berry harvest in the upper Nushagak River. There's an absence of salmon, cloudberries, blueberries, cranberries, and crowberries. That's all the berries they harvest, really. Usually weather conditions over the past few months have contributed to the poor harvest. October. This was very interesting and unusual. We still can't quite figure out what was going on with this. This was from Jessica Chernikov in Igigik. She said, we found hard mollusks inside the stomach of a moose we harvested. There were hundreds of them. I collected them, took pictures, and put them in a Ziploc bag. We were concerned about sharing this moose with elders because some have weak immune systems. So really uh, interesting what Jessica is saying, and she's right. It's something we are concerned about in public health, that as uh, people are, you know, many people living longer or living longer with uh, things like chronic disease and being treated with weakened immune systems, they may be susceptible to things that people normally didn't, uh, weren't in the past. And then in November, um, this by Luke Williams and Haynes, while I was commercial crabbing in Chilkoot Inlet, I noticed a lot of jellyfish and they were everywhere in the water. And we've been seeing this around the state as well, a lot of jellyfish blooms or large populations of jellyfish, which can be a nuisance when you're fishing, but also um, is maybe an indicator of some changes that are happening in the marine environment. And then finally, this from Veronica Redifer in Klawak. She says on December 13th, we observed coho salmon in the stream going up to spawn. On the river, the temperature was at 52 degrees Fahrenheit, clear skies, no wind, eagles, ravens, seagulls could be observed feeding on salmon carcasses on a sunny day. Could the sockeye be adapting to climate change and coming in to spawn longer, waiting for the river flow to be up? We need to adapt and maybe change current regulations governing subsistence fishing. So, you know, very, um, you know, depth, in-depth, rich and complex observation talking about the timing of when things are happening what types of things are occurring, what the potential impacts are, and a potential, um, you know, sort of policy change that uh, they want to explore in order to make sure that the community can protect but also harvest the salmon that they need. And so these kinds of observations are always uh, put on our maps and then passed on to somebody, whether it's at the Department of Fish and Game or whether it's the university or whether it's other communities in the region. So that's kind of the, the quick spin through the months there last year, looking at some of the observations that were posted. And, you know, by doing this kind of ongoing um, observation and tracking, we're beginning to see some important trends that are happening around Alaska as far as the impacts from climate change. And, uh, and we're all able to identify new environmental, you know, events that are occurring. But I thought it would be useful to sort of show you guys kind of, you know, what are the big take-home lessons that we've received from the past few years of doing this. And it's helping to uh, really kind of create a profile for what uh, the larger uh, climate change-related events are that are happening around the state. This is, of course, um, you know, a, a long-term trend map showing, you know, since... Uh, uh, 1949, what the average temperature change has been at the various National Weather Service stations, you know, all around Alaska. And the take home from this is that everywhere you go, that the numbers are positive. Um, and some are quite large, like 4.9 degrees in Talkeetna or 4.5 degrees in Barrow. But everywhere you look, the average temperature has been increasing, so that's a you know that's a good measure of our climate. So what are the outcomes? I mean, one is um, the climate is warmer. 
This, you know, it's not always a bad thing. Uh, this is on the No Attack River. These guys are enjoying a swim, um, and the water is warm and shallow, and uh, and the parents feel safer because the kids can go out and play in it. Um, but on the other hand, the water is so low. It was in No Attack that year. It was preventing people to get upstream to some of their important harvest areas. The weather is changing and more extreme. This is uh, Kivalina, uh, a coastal island in northwest Alaska, and there's no ice on the shore, so the waves are really beating up the bank, and they're doing what they can to try to shore up their, their, their uh, coastline. There's less ice on the land and on the sea, and if you fly over the uh, Lake Clark Pass in south-central Alaska in the summertime, after the snow is melted, you'll see the layers of ash that have, you know, kind of settled over the top of the glacier. And, um, you know, from years of pollution or volcanic eruptions or whatever it might be, it's creating this, uh, you know, this dark layer and, and helping to expedite and um, speed up the, the thawing and melting process of these glaciers. Also, the, we have a shorter ice season. This was a typical picture from, you know, uh, the past. Uh, this is from June 2004, but it shows up in Barrow, um, a whaling, uh, whaling crew sitting at the opening of a lead. They're camped on the ice and, and waiting for the whales to come through. Um, I went up to Barrow in 2013 and took this picture. There was no ice to go out on, and the uh, um, hunters were waiting on, they'd already harvested, but they were butchering on the beach, and that's a very unusual event to be doing this, and you can imagine that butchering something as big as a whale and complicated as a whale on a sandy beach is not quite as, you know, easy or clean as a process as it is when you're on an ice platform. We're seeing a lot of uh, lake change, um, not just in the temperature of the water or what's growing in the lakes, but also we're seeing um, the drawing of many lakes, especially up in the north where they're, they're perched on top of a layer of permafrost. So as that thaw depth increases um, in the summertime, as it thaws down, it allows some of these lakes to drain out. And that's important because this is bird habitat, but also it's um, water resource for, for communities. And that the rivers are becoming wider and shallower. This is um, next to Kivalina. This is the Woolock River. People travel to hunt uh, and fish and, and also where the water supply is for the community. And you can see how the, you know, the basically the bank is just thawed out. The permafrost is thawed. And when it does that, it collapses. It breaks off. It floats out into the middle of the river and then it grounds. So it's a hazard if you're traveling, and um, it's also changing the water quality significantly in the river. This is a picture from up on the North Slope. You know, the coasts are really just, uh, um, you know, permafrost base. There's not much rock up there, and we're seeing these huge um, calving off of the coastline as a result of thawing. This picture is from Point Lay up in the North Slope region again. Um, because of the lack of sea ice um, and the distance of the sea ice from where the normal feeding grounds are for walrus, they've begun to haul out much more frequently on the land. And so there's a whole different seasonal home for these walruses, and people are concerned about you know whether they are going to be vulnerable to predation from things like polar bears or, and also whether they're going to be able to, um, you know, commute to harvest areas um, or whether they're going to deplete the, the clams and other things that they feed on within that area. And the sea ice conditions for hunting are important too. Um, of course, these, these guys are going out to, to go sealing and uh, they you know, depend upon the sea ice in order to, uh, you know, spot and also hunt. 
and also if ice conditions are, are, are lighter, they can be, the ice is moving around much more than it used to be and it can be a hazard for small boats. One thing that we um, hear about all over the state is challenges as far as preparing food. You know, many people in, um, especially in northern Alaska, depend really heavily on not just smoking, that's more of a southern thing, but really drying fish and seal meat. Um, and when the conditions are more um, humid or there's more rain occurring, it can make it very difficult to adequately dry food. So food preparation is a, is a big topic and something people post observations about. Storing food as well, this is up on the um, northwest slope of Alaska um, in Wainwright. This is a traditional underground ice cellar in, in the permafrost and you can see how the bank has eroded back and now it's, they're going to lose that cellar. Increasingly there have been unusual die-offs. We already talked about this a little bit. But also there's uh, declines happening in some of the important wildlife species and something we really need to keep an eye on. Not just the health of the wildlife or the ability to harvest it, but where the wildlife is and when it's appearing. So we have uh, harvest restrictions now being implemented in the northwest for moose, sheep, and caribou. Also in other parts of the state, caribou declines. We have king salmon declines happening. Uh, we have restrictions in South Central Alaska on the harvest of shellfish. So there's a lot of change happening, whether it's related to climate change is, you know, is, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, it's certainly something that raises concerns about food security. Some animals are increasing their range. This is a red fox that was, um, these, these guys are moving further north and they're much more aggressive than the Arctic foxes. So they're out competing and sort of pushing the um, Arctic fox out of their range. And there's also concerns about the uh, expansion of rabies and some other parasite type um, diseases that could be carried by foxes and spread into new areas. Some animals are seeing their range decline. Of course, we know about the polar bear and the, some of the challenges that the polar bears are facing. As far as infrastructure, uh, we see a lot of this in communities as far as um, erosion and permafrost thaw. This is a large landslide that occurred along the Taylor Highway in 2010. So, uh, you know, questions about the, um, you know, ability of people to get from one place, place to another, but also in rural communities, whether you're going to be able to, you know, get food and other supplies in by road. Travel can be more hazardous. Uh, this is out in Shishmaref during this um, spring seal hunt, and uh, the hunters are using basically everything from sleds to boats to snow machines to try to navigate over the ice conditions. And many communities are vulnerable to land change. So this is a thawing coastline, again in Shishmaref, where they're uh, trying to armor their coast as well as they can. You can see all the rock that's been put up around the, the proper, the main part of the community, but there's other areas that they haven't been able to finance with protection, so the erosion is just continuing. We have some areas of the state that are very vulnerable to uh, sea level rise or storm surge. This is the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, and we're just sh showing here a Cressus map um, that shows the uh, you know projected one meter rise inundation and an overview of how many communities are going to be impacted by that. So there's a, an awakening occurring of uh, regional and local managers and planners as far as some of the emerging challenges related to climate change. And here's an example. This is flooding that occurred in Gullivan in 2011 uh, as a result of storm surge. So, you know, with all these kinds of things, what are some of the bigger lessons with some of the bigger type of uh, adaptation actions that are going on. I mean one is to design and site our projects properly. This is a new water treatment plant in Gullivan, not in that flood area you just saw in the last picture, but up on the bluff where um, homes are now being built and some other public buildings. 
we need to build infrastructure that's resilient to change. And this is a Arctic pipeline that takes water and sewer to and from a, a home. You can see how it's sinking into the permafrost that creates a lot of stress. So we're designing uh, pipelines and uh, infrastructure that's much more flexible. And also we're, we're developing active cooling systems to help keep the to use solar energy actually to try to keep the, the permafrost cold and frozen. You know, as far as, you know, how does this affect people for the behavioral health? Um, for elders, climate change is new and can be troubling. You know, we, we expect the environment and the seasons and times of the year to be the same so we can do the same kinds of things. And it's not always that way anymore. But, but for youth, uh, many of the youth, you know, are really growing up with climate change and they're accustomed to a changing world and we think that will serve our communities well in the future that um, they, they look at the positive and they uh, are finding ways to, their, their reality is all about change, not, not about the way things are supposed to be. And here in Alaska we're finding ways to benefit from warming climate as well and that includes you know, a lot of gardening happening, like here, Linda Stotts and Cayano, the longer growing season. And this is just a, a couple of, you know, images of what a, a community in the past might have looked like during the Ice Age. Just a reminder that our climate has changed in the past, and maybe this is how the community looks today. You know, we have really built right on the coastline, and the water has come up a little bit, but we have this creek flowing in. But we need to start visioning, you know, what our communities need to look like in, for the future and how we can make our, our communities stronger and more resilient and, and just as healthy and, and respectful and resonate with our traditional values. So we like the series of, of images and this is something we're trying to do a lot of is sort of visioning for the future in our planning courses. So let's take a few minutes and talk about LEO. It was developed as a tool for communities to use for sharing information about environmental change and connecting with resources and, and others who can help bring in knowledge and uh, funding and um, expertise. And what it, we focus on is not sort of the long-term, you know, environmental issues like, you know, a, a dump site that's losing its fence line or something like that, but it's about unusual extreme or unprecedented events. Things are just starting to happen and that people using their local knowledge and traditional knowledge recognize um, our, our indicators of change. So as far as what is shared, it has to be decided upon locally within the tribal government or some other host organization. And then um, the LEO members can submit photos and text to be posted on public Google Maps. So this is from September 2014 and a nice photo from Brit. Um, once it's posted we can help refer that to, to someone who's maybe an ornithologist who can help identify that bird species. And it's a lot of it's about connecting with whoops, connecting with network members and other technical experts. LEO started, as we said, in January 2012. Now there's about 200 participants it's spreading out a little bit outside of the state, which we think is, is terrific because it, it, it expands the conversation, it brings in new resources, and it helps us get an idea of maybe some of the emerging uh, climate change related um, challenges like avian influenza or, or um, the uh, starfish die off that's happening in the um, Pacific Northwest and, and now up into Alaska as well. People post on all kinds of different topics, weather, erosion, permafrost, all these kinds of things. I mean the common, the common question for everyone is what type of unusual change is happening in my community? LEO participants apply local and traditional laws to decide what kinds of events are relevant, important, and appropriate to share. And many LEOs are also experienced with Western scientific methods. And the observations themselves can come from anyone in the community, 
but the LEOs serve as their local contacts for collecting, reviewing, and completing the information and for follow-up based on the findings and technical consultations. And just a few of the, the types of tools that are on here. Um, you know, it's we built the, the network on web-based services and social media that are either free or openly accessible to everyone. So, I mean, we use YouTube and, and Flickr and Facebook. And then over here on the uh, right side is, is a uh, really a map archive. This is where you can find all the different maps that show by region or by topic um, the kinds of observations that have been shared. And then we have spreadsheets um, on, our, on our page. There's actually a 2014 one there now as well, but you can see all the observations that were posted during the year and, and download it. It's a PDF of a spreadsheet. This is what it looks like. So you'll have by observation number and by the individual and a link to the map and some of the other information that was provided. And then I mentioned that we have a monthly webinar where we can talk about, um, hear firsthand from people about their observations and bring on people who can provide technical consults. And here's a picture of our webinar host, Moses Chirpanoff, and our web page where we have these. Good or, a good observation provides information about the nature of the observation as well as why it is unique and important. And there's also a social networking component. There's a private map that's only open to members where you can go ahead and get some contact information for different members by clicking on their community. And we have lots of people who provide technical consults from uh, folks at agencies, people from other communities, um, people in academic institutions, and so forth. And our website, this is where you would go to, to join the network. It's just a short form. And then over here, this is how you post an observation. And it's another, it's a short uh, Zoomerang form where you fill out some basic information about what you've seen and what you want to share. And we also send out a weekly um, electronic newsletter or electronic journal that uh, includes a link to the LEO map so people who aren't members of the network but are interested in it can go ahead and receive this and uh, follow what types of observations LEO network members are, are sharing. And we have a broad range of observations. Most of them that come in are actually about you know wildlife, animals, insects, birds, fish, but there's also quite a few that are about sort of an environmental landscape like mountain change, forest change, coast change, and things like that. And I'm just going to pop, just have a couple more slides, but you know these these observations over the course of a month or a year, they you know they they start to tell a story and sometimes they resonate or you see common types of events occurring. So it's it's not just you know uh, helpful for us uh, on the local level, but it's it's, it's helping to, us to understand the bigger changes that are happening around Alaska. And I'm not going to go into this one because we're low on time, but this is a whole you know all these different indicators which really had to do with about you know extremely warm sea temperatures that happened um, last summer and and are continuing where we had temperatures several degrees above normal. So it, there's sometimes we can link it to some kind of a some kind of an actual um, uh, cause. So that's kind of it. You know, we have um, a LEO network in Alaska. We have a new LEO network developing with the Yurok tribe in Northern California. There's interest in developing this in other areas. We hope it's a good model that helps people understand the um, you know, help will help people understand what climate change impacts are where they live. And I think I'll just I'll stop right there. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I'm sorry about the connection, and it's it's just really nice to be here and have a chance to share. Thanks a lot, Mike. This is Sue um, Watkins. Um, if anyone has a question, please type it into the question box, and I will read it out loud um, to Mike so he can answer it. Um, someone did just type in um, where they can get a copy of the PowerPoint, um, and I put in the chat box 
again, the link to ITEP's um, Climate Change Webinars webpage where um, we will be posting the presentation and the recording. Um, it may take a week or two for these to be uh, posted. So uh, if anyone has any questions, please type them in. Um, okay, somebody has just submitted a question. Um, as you know, recently a paper published <laughs> regarding the blob, a northern Pacific warm water event that is affecting west coast and east in snowfall. What is your interest to expand Leo to east coast peoples? I, I think um, we have a lot of interest and I think it's because um, what, what we're realizing is that there's, there's much broader connections happening because of climate change than ever before. I mean there's the obvious connections with like migratory bird routes and other migratory animal routes and just these big weather systems but there's also um, you know examples of with with for example sea ice uh, thawing and opening up of the northern seaway you know we're, we're seeing um, outbreaks of disease and for example ice seals which may be related to populations that have previously been uh, isolated beginning to um, meet each other and mix with each other so I think there's lots of you know broader you know continental but also global connections that are happening and by having you know excellent op observers who really understand their environment and communities all around the country it will help us to see these when they're when they're when they're coming, and also to um, to let other people know what's going on, so hopefully we can respond to it. But also, um, there may be, you know, a beetle infestation or something going on, and or you know, a jellyfish bloom, whatever it might be, happening in the in the Atlantic, that we would really benefit from the knowledge up here in Alaska or or in other communities around the country. So I think that's part of it. Is, you know. Uh, applying all of this expertise that's happening that's available in tribal environmental programs and in communities all around the country so that we can all you know answer questions and and do our best to take care of our local environment and, and our local people um, okay here's another question is Leo information being shared with policymakers the Arctic Council etc are schools using the information there, we do have a. We started a Leo Youth program, which which basically is, you know, uh, if there is a community that already has a Leo Network member in it, then a youth can go ahead and also sign up as a Leo, and then there's a mentoring relationship with that, uh, you know, the host organization and with the Leo member, and then they can do, you know, post observations and do everything as well. It hasn't really taken off yet, so we're looking for ways to get the word out, and we're looking for administrators and teachers and students that are interested in that program. As far as the other part of it, um, yes, there is quite a bit of uh, interest, and we have shared with the Arctic Council, um, and we've we're sharing with policymakers, and I think um, there is, I think there's uh, EPA is been very supportive of it. Other agencies have also been supportive. So I think there's um, opportunity for this to expand and grow. And and part of the challenge is finding, you know, uh, uh, universities, tribal organizations that can be the hosts for you know kind of regional programs, which is the way the model's been developed. And, and just looking for people who like to participate. But it's, I I think it's. Uh, I think that that opportunity is there. Okay, here's the next one. Um, Aloha, Mike. Awesome presentation. My name is Emily. I am a graduate student from the University of Hawaii doing similar work. My question is, how did you get the elders to feel comfortable documenting information? I know traditionally writing things down is not as comfortable or familiar to elders, especially in Hawaii. One suggestion from someone in my community was to have a youth 
kind of shadow an elder and document the information in a journal. I'm curious if you had the same issue and how you worked through it to get elders to document. Oh, good question. I think, um, well, I right now there's some interest in other places around the Arctic to have a Leo type program. And what we're realizing is, you know, not everywhere has the same kind of um, capacity development that we have here in the United States. And maybe there's people listening from outside the United States to this webinar, but, you know, the EPA um, IGAP program, which is really the backbone of, of the people that participate here in Alaska, has done a great service by you know, building capacity, resources, and bringing technology so that, you know, in even in remote areas, people have computers. So the participants are, they sign on, they volunteer um, to be participant in the program, and they're usually, you know, recognized as the environmental expert for their community. And so I think it's, you know, it's the trust in the tribal staff who participate in the program and, and having the backing of their, you know, tribal government or there's a few other organizations that participate as well, but having their backing is really important. And, um, you know, as far as, you know, the, the, the elders bring so much to this discussion, um, they, they really can connect the dots and have the long-term memories and knowledge and, you know, bring that in. But, you know, the youth part's super interesting too, and I think it's because the environment is changing so quickly that, you know, whereas 50 years ago we would be totally dependent upon elders to bring in information about the change that's happening, now even, you know, kids in grade school have seen, you know, new species of wildlife or, or an unusual winter, and they, they know it and they recognize it, and they're engaging in the environment in different ways. So. I think everybody in the community really has a lot to contribute on this topic. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, can you talk about what you do with the observations once they are entered? I assume there is someone reviewing the observations and finding experts for your webinars, but is there so also some compilation of observations going on? Okay, sure, yeah. The, you know, the, there is, there's a lot of really excellent uh, usually more topical um, observation networks and citizen science networks that are available and we quite often refer observations on to those organizations like there's one you know it's called the lost ladybug program and they're really focused on ladybugs and other ones that are really focused on birds so when an observation comes in you know a lot of what we're doing is sort of being the um, you know, the, the old telephone operator and trying to connect people to good resources who want to help. But it'll come in on our Zoomerang survey, we'll take a look at it, we'll um, usually contact, there's a lot of going on after that which is a little different than some citizen science programs because there's a consult involved. So we'll contact the uh, person who posted the observation and then we'll, you know, make any additions to the post so that's a really good post, maybe get photos if we need them or if we can get them, um, fill in any of the missing pieces and then we'll connect the observer with an email to someone who's a, you know, a entomologist or works on algal blooms, wherever they might be in the country, whoever, whatever the topic is, we'll try to connect them with someone who we know is a good, uh, you know, can provide good consulting information and then the outcome actually goes back into the post on the map, so it's captured for next time. So whatever we learn is available, and then it's, it's, it's sent out to the rest of the network so people know what, what the outcome of that case was. Okay, um, we saw some more questions. Uh, the next one is, have you linked up with the Center for Coastal Margin Observation and Prediction at the Oregon Health and Science University? John Waterhouse is the Indigenous Peoples Scholar. I know John uh, from his time up here with the Yukon River Watershed Council, but I wasn't aware John was doing that now. Um, it sounds really interesting. 
and be someone if if someone has a link or connection they could send to me I would I would link up with them um, yeah and and that information was provided so I'll, I'll get that to you um, the next question um, for those aspiring to become more involved with this ki kind of environmental um, and human health research and practice what types of career paths do you see that would lead to work like this Oh wow! That, I've never had that question before. That's a really great one. Um, you know, I think you know what what we're doing is we're we're really connecting uh, environmental, you know, management with some of the wildlife management and public health, and and there's probably some other things in there as well. Um, but as far as a career path. I think a couple interesting things are going on. One is uh, President Obama recently convened a meeting with a lot of different uh, university leaders to talk about the importance of integrating climate change, and that includes medical schools. Even you know they're integrating climate change as a major com curriculum component. So I think you're going to see you know. Uh, shades of climate change showing up in many different classrooms around the country. But the one we're really keeping an eye on and we think it has real special relevance for um, native communities around the country is, is this One Health concept. And the uh, right now the University of Alaska Fairbanks has a brand new veterinary school that is connected with Colorado State University and it's only in their second year, but this idea of One Health, uh, intersection between environment, wildlife, livestock, and um, public health is, is their major underlying topic, you know, focus topic for that whole program. So we think that One Health, you know, is, is one of the areas that really seem to resonate with the LEO network. Okay. Um, there uh, a few more questions. Are there similar indigenous peoples organizations as LEO in other parts of the world that LEO is collaborating with where climate change phenomena and its effects on local communities are being documented? Yeah, I, you know, we, we're, we're, we're just starting to learn about that, but we um, I know there's going to be some outreach through the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which is a, a just a few years of chairmanship. But there's some interest in, you know, exploring ways to expand a network like this to other Arctic nations. Um, and e and the Environmental Protection Agency is working on a, you know, expanding this sort of north and south from the continental United States to um, Canada and Mexico. But uh, you know, one thing, one really good fit we think is any place where there are uh, indigenous organizations, because you know, in this day and age we live in, people move around so much that um, you know, a lot of people have kind of lost that you know, familiarity with what the environment is supposed to look like, or used to look like, or should look like. And but in the um, indigenous communities around the world, people do live closer to the land and have really great observational skills and can help us to understand uh, what is changing and, and what's important, you know, at a really, um, you know, very detailed level. So we, we think it's a, it's a good, um, I think that's why it's worked well in Alaska is, and we think maybe in other places like that it would work well. Okay, I think Oh, a few more questions. <laughs> they keep coming in. Um, does Leo have an indirect? Excuse me. Does Leo have a direct action component that promotes more than just information, but rather direct political advocacy? Okay. Well, that that gets into a little bit about how how do you apply this information? Um, there's a couple of different ways where we think it may be applied and we hope it is applied. Uh, one is that, you know, that there's a signal coming out from a, a local observer. And what they're saying is, you know, there's something happening here and it's important. 
and we are interested in it, and we quite often we'd like to learn more or at least let others know what's going on. So in that way, we think it can help to guide research funding decisions and research partnerships with universities. So for an example, um, we quite often will get a, an observation about a, let's say, a, a fish that has parasites in it, you know, and people are, the local observer is saying, you know, we have never seen this many fish in a net hall that has this condition, and we'll send the, the fish to the, or a picture of the fish to the, the state experts on it, the fish pathology lab, and they're really great at saying, oh, it's this kind of parasite, and it, it's not harmful, you just have to cook it, and and it's, you know, it has been seen in Alaska before. Those kinds of things we'll hear about. But it's all the other questions that we don't get answered, like, you know, why is it happening now, and why is it happening here, and why is, you know, why so many? And usually that kind of knowledge isn't available. It requires some kind of a research partnership, and that means that someone's got to come up with some money, and there has to be some kind of connection happening with the university, and a partnership with the community to do it. So those kinds of follow-up um, activities have been happening after an observation is posted. And then the other part is, um, you know, how are we using these, this really based traditional sort of knowledge, observ local observations in order to drive policy. Well, one thing we've done in Alaska is form a, what's called the One Health Group. And the One Health Group meets quarterly. It has um, sort of the some of the agency leads, so some tribal health representatives. There's the state veterinarian. There's the state epidemiologist from public health. There's a few people from Canada as well that participate, wildlife people. Uh, public health people, infectious disease people, and we meet every quarter and we start off with a map, reviewing a map that includes relevant LEO posts, that kind of covers those topics, and also uh, other media events that have been put on our maps that show, you know, when there's a report about starfish die-off or a uh, harmful algal bloom or... So basically, the, the conversation as far as management of these problems begins with the local observer maps. And so that's how one way we found to kind of push it up to, you know, the management community and hopefully it'll influence seasonal decisions on regulations and stuff like that. And then we also put out a, that weekly e-news, so, and there's several thousand people in a lot, uh, around the Circumpolar North in Alaska and other places that get those. So, um, you know, press can receive that, media, uh, agencies, uh, academics, a lot of people get that and then we'll get some kind of response from them and be able to connect them with the community that's, that's concerned or interested in that topic. Okay, another question. Um, do you have updated observations on recent bird flu that migratory birds may have brought to our state? That's yeah, w that's really interesting because it's some that's a great example of a continental kind of issue that um, it's kind of like West Nile virus. You know, it's something that's having a big impact in the lower 48 states and in Canada, but it hasn't quite made it to Alaska yet, so we're really interested in it. Um, so we had a USGS scientist <laughs> present at our last webinar uh, for the LEO network, or actually it was a couple, it was two webinars ago, two months ago, and um, he, he presented on avian mortality events, including avian cholera, but just trying to, to help the observers know what to look for and what to worry about, what not to worry about, and what to do in case it comes to you know your neighborhood. And shortly thereafter, there was the the what was really cool was the um, observer in St. Mary's, you know, kind of got that information out to the community about you know keep an eye out for this hunters because spring hunting is beginning. And then you know a, sort of a funny story happened in that some children 
brought into the Leo's office and put on his desk uh, a dead chickadee. And he said, oh, well, you know, what have you got for me here? And they're like, well, it's this bird fell out of the sky. And he's like, well, you know, did it hit a window? I mean, did it get attacked by something? I mean, and they're like, no, no, it just, it just fell out of the sky. So then he was like, hmm, well, that is a very, you know, that's, that is unusual. And so he posted it, and we put him in contact with the uh, USGS, and they said, well, this is probably not a species or, you know, a big enough event to, to be worried about, but let's go through with it and, and, and sort of go through the exercise. And so then they arranged to have the bird sent into Anchorage where it was inspected by, uh, they did an examination on it, and then provide a consult, a consult back to the community to say, no, it doesn't look like it has any signs of avian influenza, but if you see more, you know, of birds like this, then this is the kind of guidance you'd need in order to collect it safely, preserve it safely, and alert people. So it, it shows that the, um, you know, how important when events are happening, local observers are, especially environmental folks, because it's, it's something that they're going to be called upon more and more to, to um, respond to. Um, someone sent in uh, the name of a similar global network, which, Mike, you may be familiar with, the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Assessment. No, I haven't seen that. Um, that sounds really cool. So, Sue, if you have that one, too, I'd love to take a look at it. Yeah, I have the name of it. Um, uh, I don't have the email ad or the website. I can look it up. But the person who sent this was Preston Hardison at Tulalip Tribes. All right. Well, thank you, Preston, for sharing that. If you want to chat about that some more, just shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, this is people's chance to send in one last question because um, we've gone through all the, the many questions we've received. Um, so if you have a burning question, type it in right now because um, otherwise we're going to wrap this up in just a minute. And maybe that's it. Oh, so to answer that question though, uh, I, I just recall what that was. That, but there, as far as I know, <clears throat> um, there haven't been any cases of avian influenza identified in Alaska. So I just want to make sure I got that out there. Okay. Um, okay, well, no more questions have come in, so I, I, let's wrap this up. Um, Mike, I want to thank you again for uh, joining and um, even despite the technical glitches, um, we really appreciate you, you really trying hard to get on and you did make it and a great presentation. Um, and I'm sure that if anyone has any more questions, they can contact you um, and, um, and, and ask, your, ask questions to you directly. Um, so again, thank you. And with that, let's um, end the webinar. Thank you, Sue. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody.